Shalom and welcome to Talmud for Beginners. Today is our third lesson and we're going to be changing track dates. We're going to be uh, going today into track date Gitin. Uh, we were before track date Nedarim, today we're in track date Gitin. Gitin is a track date that deals with the somewhat unpleasant subject of um, divorce and the bill of divorcement. Uh, but before we do that, I want to answer a couple of questions uh, for those that, uh, that have uh, asked certain questions. One, uh, in the last teaching, I mentioned uh, that the, the uh, Talmud has 63 tractates divided into six orders. And some of you have said, Rabbi, my Talmud doesn't have 63 tractates. My Talmud only has 37 tractates. Uh, is this a defective Talmud, or were you incorrect? What's wrong here? Well, uh, the reason that your Talmud may only have 20, uh, 37 tractates is because there, uh, remember we said in the first lesson that the Talmud is made up of the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Mishnah is the core part of the Talmud that was written around 250, or compiled and edited together around 250 by Rabbi Judah. And the Gemara of the Babylonian Talmud was uh, compiled and edited together around 500 CE, 250 years later. And the Mishnah and the Gemara together make up the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, the Mishnah and the uh, Jerusalem Gemara, of course, make up the Jerusalem Talmud, but that's the, we're talking about the Babylonian Talmud. Um, there are only 37 tractates of Mishnah for which there is any Gemara in the Babylonian Talmud. It's a little bit different with the Jerusalem Talmud. There's different tractates. There, for example, in the first order, which deals with agriculture, uh, the Babylonian Talmud has only Gemara for the first tractate. No Gemara for the other tractates. We mentioned this in our first lesson. But the Jerusalem Talmud has Gemara for all the tractates of, that's, of that order. So there's a little difference as to which one has, most of them are, are the same, but there's some difference as to which one has Gemara for which tractates. All in all, the Babylonian Talmud only has Gemara for 37 tractates. Many Talmud editions, therefore, will only publish the, the portions for which there's actually Gemara, because the rest is really just Mishnah. However, technically speaking, the, Mish the Talmud has 63 tractates, and many Talmud some Talmud editions will publish the whole thing. Uh, others will expect you to get a copy of the Mishnah to get tractate of vote. So, for example, if you get Jacob uh, Neusner's Talmud, uh, then you only get 37 tractates. Uh, however, uh, you can get Jacob Neusner's Mishnah to get the rest. You'll have all 63 tractates of the Mishnah uh, as well. Okay, Tractate of Vote, for example, is a tractate that has no Mishnah, uh, no Gemara. And so uh, it would not be included in those kinds of Talmud editions. But it's really still part of the Talmud. Uh, because the entire Mishnah is really part of the Talmud. Okay, today we're going to be studying... Um, as I said, in Kiti oh, there's one more question I had to answer. <coughs> the difference between the phrase, the sages say, and our rabbis taught. I told you in the first study that Talmud is difficult to understand without some guidance, without someone to teach you some of the key terms, key phrases, to understand the context and meaning. And one of these is that when you read the sages say, we've talked about this in our previous studies, when we read the sages say, we are reading a um, reference to the majority. And this is something we usually read in the Mishnah. The majority of sages teach. So if it says the sages say, it means we're not going to tell you all of them, but the majority of the sages said, or hochamim it is in Hebrew. The majority taught this particular teaching or held this position. When we read the phrase, our rabbis taught, which is a phrase that we will most commonly see, uh, uh, we will see commonly in the Gemara, that phrase is actually used as an introduction to a beretta. 
A bereta is a tradition that appears in the Gemara that is not from the Mishnah, but it goes to some Mish, uh, source from the same period as the Mishnah. Okay? Um, sometimes it's the uh, Tosefta. Sometimes it's from the uh, um, one of the Halakhic Midrashim, like this, uh, the Sifre. Or uh, sometimes it's totally unique uh, to the Gemara, and only this is only, only the first only source we have for the Bereta or Beresa, as it's called in the Ashkenazi pronunciation. Okay, so um, uh, these are the. Uh, um, uh, there's a dis different difference between the phrase uh, the sages say and our rabbis taught, because there are times when the Gemara will uh, ascribe a position to our rabbis taught that is not the majority position and not the halakha at all. Okay. Um, today we're studying in Tractate Gitin. As I said, this deals with the topic of divorce. I have chosen the tractates that we are covering, or the, I have chosen the, sorry, the Mishnot that we are covering in, uh, at least at the beginning of this beginner's class, very carefully because they meet certain criteria that makes them easy uh, and good material for beginners. And this uh, particular text is good for beginners for a couple of reasons. One, I look for a Mishnah that has a relatively short Gemara, maybe only a page or two. Because sometimes the Gemara can go on for many pages. Um, excuse me. I'm also looking for a um, Mishnah that are interesting, relevant. Um, they're all relevant in some degree, but that uh, maybe are rel more relevant to our lives, or maybe to helping us understand the scriptures, um, in a, in a a way that we can really see is interesting. There are Mishnah sections that debate such things as, you know, just how many logs of wine versus how many logs of water, uh, that's a unit of measure, were used in the water libation ceremony and go into you know discussion of just how much uh, when it, you know water was in each well that's that's not a really good discussion to get into for beginners um, however uh, this particular study I think is good uh, I also picked this one because it is unique I actually picked it to some degree because it's not representative let me explain what I mean um, the, there were two major schools debating in the Talmud, in Talmud, you know, two major schools, not, there's others, but the two major ones are the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. There's classic conflicts between these schools. Now, the Zohar tells us that uh, the, the difference between the schools is that the school of Hillel was rooted in Chesed, and the school of Shammai was rooted in Gevara. Uh, Hesed is uh, loving kindness, mercy, grace. Gevara is severity, judgment. Okay, and so um, uh, the uh, we have these two countering schools, and Yeshua's very much like Hillel. Yeshua's halacha normally sides with Hillel. Yeshua's teaching normally parallels Hillel. Uh, Hillel Yeshua says, do not, do not to others what you would not have them do to you. Hillel says, do not to others what you would not have them do to you. Um, there are many, many parallels between their teachings. Um, and so Yeshua was, you know, you might say was a teacher of the school of Hillel. Hillel lived in Yeshua, at the time of it taught during Yeshua's youth. And so uh, um, Yeshua typically is Hillelian, okay? Fits with Hillel very well. But that's not the case with today's Gemara and today's Mishnah. Uh, today's Talmud passage, 
Yeshua's agreement will be unusually with the school of Shammai. And so uh, that is one of the reasons that I have chosen this particular text. Today's Talmud passage is a um, discussion concerning a passage of Torah. So we should begin from the background by looking at the passage of Torah, which is Deuteronomy chapter 24, the first four verses. When a man takes a wife and marries her, then it comes to pass if she find no favor in his eyes, because he has found some unseemingly thing in her, that he writes her a bill of divorcement and gives it into her hand and sends her out of his house. Really, this is the key verse, but I'll read the rest. And she departs out of his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. And the latter husband hates her and writes her a bill of divorcement and gives it to her hand and sends her out of his house. Or if the latter husband die, who took her to be his wife, her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled for that is abomination before Yahweh, and you shall not cause the land to sin, which Yahweh your Elohim gives you for an inheritance. Okay, so um, this is the section of Torah that we're going to be discussing, and which the uh, sages of the Talmud will be debating. And so our passage in, is Mishnah, Nine uh, Mishnah Gitin, Chapter Nine Mishnah Ten, and it is uh, beginning at the, towards the top of page ninety A in the Babylonian Talmud in Tractate Gitin. The House of Shemai says a man should divorce his wife only because he found grounds for it in unchastity. Since it is said, because he is found in her indecency in anything. Deuteronomy 24.1. And the house of Hillel says, even if she spoiled his dish. Since it is said, because he is found in her indecency in anything. And you see how each is stressing a different part of the passage. So Shammai says a man can divorce his wife only if there's some matter of indecency. There's got to be a matter of indecency. And uh, Hillel says no, no, no. It can be anything. Even it can be anything at all. Even if she spoils his dish, she burns his dinner, he can divorce her because she bur he burned, she, she burned his dinner. Okay. And we'll look as we get into the Gemara and, and more at the, the passage. Rabbi Akiba says, even if he found someone else prettier than she, since it is said, and it shall be if she find no favor in his eyes. Deuteronomy 24.1. So Rabbi Akiba says, look, even, it doesn't even have to be anything. Shouldn't even have to burn his food. If he just loses interest in her, maybe he finds someone else prettier. He can divorce her because he lost interest in her. That's Rabbi Akiba's position. Okay? Now, a key to this is the particular Hebrew wording where it says um, indecency in anything. The word is in the Hebrew is devar ar arot. Devar arot. What is a devar arot? an unclean matter or a matter of indecency. 
The word devar in Hebrew means word, matter, or thing. So we have a matter of indecency or a thing of indecency, perhaps. Um, this is what Shammai says. Shammai says it means some matter of indecency. And Yalel says no, because the word devar can mean thing. So what it really means, the word devar can mean anything. Literally, it's to just thing, a thing or anything. So if there's a devar, a thing, he can divorce her because she burned his food. Okay, so that's uh, that's where the the the, uh, the conflict is is coming in here. Okay. We talked before about what a wonderful thing it is that our Talmud preserves the minority opinion as well as the majority opinion. And today we're going to learn to what a degree the Talmud goes to actually preserving the position of the minority right down to minute detail. Which is beneficial to us because sometimes we agree with the minority. This is the beauty of the Talmud. It, 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 it's, it, it preserves, in many cases, the whole debate, the whole discussion, and gives us, as Nazarenes, the opportunity, for example, if our opinion would seem to fall with the minority, to even get a better understanding of the position of the minority, which we're going to today. <coughs> it has been taught on Tanite authority, essentially. It has been taught. said the house of Hillel to the house of Shammai. This is, in other words, reciting a Bereta here. The house of Hillel to the house of Shammai. But doesn't scripture say thing? Devar? Does it say devar? Thing? Deuteronomy 24.1. The house of Shammai says response. But doesn't scripture say indecency said to them the house of Hillel if the word indecency were stated but the word thing devar was not stated I might have supposed that only on account of indecency she goes forth but on account of any other thing she does not go forth Therefore, the word thing was used, and if the word thing was used, but not the word indecency, I might have supposed that if it was on account of any other thing that she was divorced, then she may remarry a third party. But if it was on account of indecency, she may not marry a third party. Therefore, the language indecency was used. So Hillel says, in response to Shammai, that the word indecency appears here, not because it must be a matter of indecency, but because we are to understand that if it is a matter of indecency, she cannot remarry a third party. But if it is a matter of, if it's just anything, she burned his food or something, then she can remarry. That's what Hillel says. And how does the house of Shammai deal with the word thing? This is the beauty, as I said, of the Talmud preserving the minority position. The Talmud is going to tell us how Shammai responded to Hillel. Shammai says, here we find reference to thing or devar or word or matter and elsewhere we find reference to the same matter. Thus, okay, what we have here is, is a, one of the rules of Hillel, which is Gezara Shiva, the equivalence of expressions. And Gezara Shiva means that we, okay, uh, where a key term or phrase appears. Uh, this is very similar, similar to uh, the rule, rules like uh, 
uh, the rule of first reference in this case, uh, where we use an earlier reference to a key phrase or term to interpret a later reference. So Shammai says that here we find reference to thing and elsewhere we find reference to the same matter, or the word thing again, namely in Deuteronomy 19.15, by the mouth of two witnesses or by the mouth of three witnesses shall a thing be established, a devar, a word. Yielding this proposition, just as in that case, two witnesses are required, so here also two witnesses are required to establish the facts of the matter. In other words, Shammai says the word devar is put in Deuteronomy 24.1, so that we understand that Deuteronomy 19.15 applies. That it's not just a matter of indecency. It's not just indecency. He can't just accuse his wife of indecency, write her a bill of divorcement, and hand it to her and say, well, you were indecent, you go, go packing. But Shammai's position is not only that, it's there to point us back to Deuteronomy 19.15 and tell us specifically that the indecency must be established on the testimony of two witnesses, or three witnesses, at least two witnesses. And this is good hermeneutics. This is, in fact, Shammai is probably having a little fun because he's probably turning around to Hillel and saying, by the way, uh, doesn't one of your uh, your rules say Gazara Shiva? Uh, one of your rules of interpretation? So Hill, Shammai is using Hillel's rules of interpretation to prove Hillel wrong. <laughs> He's using Hillel's rules of interpretation to prove his point. Our Gemara says, and the house of Hillel, in other words, how did the house of Hillel respond to Shammai? Shammai has made a very good point. He's, you know, score one for Shammai. Not only did Shammai make his point, but he did it using one of Hillel's rules. And the house of Hillel says, is the formation in decency in a thing? Which would have, in other words, does it say in? Is the word in there? He doesn't say in. The word isn't in isn't there. That's what Hillel is, the house of Hillel is saying. <coughs> Not necessarily Hillel and Shammai themselves having this debate, although it may have been. But the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai were having this debate. Could have been their followers after their, their, their death. In the years after their death. Is the formation in decency in a thing? which would have yielded this meaning? It doesn't say in. doesn't say in. That's not what it says, Shammai. There's no word in there. You're reading into the text, my boy. That's what Hillel is saying to Shammai. And the house of Shammai? Well, here we are into the third round of the argument, and the Talmud is still preserving our man's minority opinion, even though rabbinic Judaism ultimately rejects it. Isn't that wonderful for us? Because we've got all this wonderful exegesis to back our opinion. And the house of Shammai says, responds to Hillel, it says, is the formation either descend indecency or a thing? So it says, well, you know, the word in isn't there, which really in Hebrew is just a prefix, but the word or isn't there either. You're interpreting it to mean indecency or a thing, or a thing or indecency. And so, you know, you're living in a glass house. You're calling the kettle black. How can you complain that our interpretation uh, is faulty because it doesn't actually have the word in there when your interpretation is just as faulty because it doesn't have the word or there. <laughs> and how does the house of Hillel sh respond? The house of Hillel says, and our Kamara says, that is why what is written in decency of a thing. 
Because the word of can be understood. There is no word there at all, just indecency thing, okay? Or thing indecency. Which bears this meaning and that meaning as well. So he argues that, Hillel argues that, he, that the way the text reads could read his way. Okay, so this is the classic argument between Hillel and Shemai over whether it means indecency only or anything. Hillel says you can divorce the wife for anything, even if she just burns your feet. But now let's remember Akiba, where Akiba enters the debate. Now we know he's after the time of Hillel and Shemai. He's late late 1st century, early 2nd century. So he comes along and takes it a step further. He says, even if he found someone else prettier than she is, since it is said, and it shall be if she find no favor in his eyes. How so? What's at stake? What's at stake is the issue addressed by Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish. For said Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, the word ki, that's the word that we translate because. Okay? The word ki, returning to our original text, by the way, in Deuteronomy 24, 1, when a man takes a wife and marries her, then it comes to pass, if she find no favor in his eyes, that's the phrase that Akiba is keying on, okay? If she find no favor in his eyes, and then this next word, because, because, ki, in the Hebrew, ki, he has found some unseemingly thing or indecent thing or devar thing, a devar indecency in her, that he writes her a bill of divorcement and gives it in her hand and sends her out of his house. Okay. So, Lakish says the word key may be translated in four ways. If, perhaps, but, or because. So there's four basic meanings. In other words, the, key, the word key is ambiguous. It can mean more than one thing. In this case, we're debating, does it mean because? Which is how we understand it. Um, or does it mean something else? The house of Shammai maintain that the verse is to be read. It comes to pass that she finds no favor in his eyes because... He has found some unseemingly thing in her, some thing of indecency in her. So she finds no favor in his eyes, not just for any reason, but because he found some indecency in her. But Rabbi he wants a, Akiva wants us to render it. It comes to pass that she finds no favor in his eyes. Oh, uh, or if again, or if again, he has found some unseemingly thing in her because the word key, according to, uh, to uh, Lakish, Simon ben Lakish, can mean if, because, but, if, perhaps, but, or because. And so he wants to translate it if. She finds no favor in his eyes if he has found something unseemingly in her. Or if he's found something unseemingly in her, in other words. So by rendering the word key a little bit differently, he says, ah, it doesn't have to be a thing, an unseemingly thing. It can just be that he, she finds no favor in his eyes. So it could even be if he finds a prettier girl. Said Rabbi Papa to Rabbah, if he found her neither in, in her neither indecency nor another thing, what is the rule? 
Okay, so here we have, in other words, um, is Akiva right? Okay, because Shammai says there has to be indecency, and in fact, it has to be confirmed by two or more witnesses. Hillel says, yeah, it doesn't have to be indecency. It can be anything. She could have burned his food, but it does have to be a thing. There has to be something, some reason. She has to be guilty of something. That's Hillel's position. But Akiva says, no, she doesn't have to be guilty of anything. It doesn't have to be her fault. He could simply have decided he doesn't like her anymore. For whatever reason, it doesn't matter. He doesn't like her anymore. She's just lost his eye. <clears throat> so Rabbi Papa says to Rabbah, if he found in her neither indecency, as Shammai's opinion, nor any other thing, which is Hillel's opinion, what is the rule? And Rabbah said, since, all, since the All Merciful has explicitly revealed with respect to the rapist, he may not be able to put her out all his days, which means his entire life. He's, this is uh, Deuteronomy 22.19. Which means his entire life. He stands under the obligation to take her back. That is the only case in which the Almighty, All-Merciful, applies this rule. But here, that is what is done is done. And he is not forced to take her back, even if the grounds of divorce were flimsy. In other words, under normal circumstances, he can leave her simply because he lost interest in her. He can give her a bill of divorce and say, I don't like you anymore. Uh, but I found a prettier girl, somebody else. Uh, you don't interest me anymore. You, have, you just lost my eye. But if it was the situation described in Deuteronomy 22, 19, where he does what we call the honorable thing and marries the virgin that he has spoiled, then he can't do that. Then it must be a matter of indecency. That's what... Rabbah says. Said Rabbi Masharshia to Rabbah. If he had decided to divorce her, but sh she is still subject to him in serving him, what is the Torah? What is the law? So what we're saying here is what happens if he's Let's, he's got a cause for divorce, and he's decided he's going to divorce, and he says, okay, you know what? I'm going to fold this up, and I'm going to put it in my pocket, and I'm going to save this for later. I'm going to put a pin right there, and put this on the back burner. I'm going to pick it up when, when it's convenient. Maybe when I, I'm going to go shopping for a prettier girl. When I find one, then I'll let her go. Can he do that? Our Gemara says, in this regard, this is actually Rabba's response, in this regard, Scripture says, do not devise evil against your neighbor since he is living securely with you, Proverbs 3.29. In other words, a man may not make the decision, have the, get the cause and make the decision to divorce his wife and not tell her, and instead continue to take advantage of her uh, and exploit her as his wife, knowing all the time he's planning to get rid of her, and then write her a bill of divorcement when he decides it's convenient or at some later time. Can't do that. <clears throat> okay? It has been taught. We have now another reference to a Beretta. In fact, this Beretta is from the Tosefta on Sotah 5.9. It has been taught. Rabbi Meir would say, just as there are different tastes in food, so there are different tastes in women. This isn't really, you know, it starts out you're thinking, oh, well, some guys like blonde, some guys like redheads. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the way men treat their wives. 
and really what's uh, what are, what's a reasonable way to teach or treat, treat a wife and what's not. Rabbi Meir would say, just as there are different tastes in food, so there are different tastes in treating women, if you will. You can have a man who, if a fly falls into his cup, tosses out the contents of the cup and won't drink what's there. He says, look, gross. I'm not going to drink this. There was a fly in it. This is the type of Papos Ben Judah who would lock his wife up when he went out. Okay? Now, remember, this is talking about uh, an, you know, this is a lot like first, second century. This is, this is from the Mishnaic period. Uh, I think it's from the second century since it's Rabbi Meir, if I'm correct. So this is uh, uh, a different time. So a person who got the fly in the cup and they throw the cup out is an extremist, is what it's trying to describe here. And he's an extremist of the way he treats his wife. He locks her up and he won't let her out when he's gone. It says, you can have a man who, if a fly falls into his cup, tosses out the fly, but drinks the contents of the cup. And this is how most men are who let their wives talk freely with their brothers and relatives. So most men are not like that with their wives. The average man doesn't do that. He's not an extremist. He, he, if, if, a, uh, uh, if his wife talks to her relatives and talks to her brothers, that's fine. He, he, he's not bothered by that. He doesn't try and control his wife to the point of not even letting her talk to her own relatives and brothers and such. That's not that's not that, that that's that's normal. That's normal behavior. Uh, Rabbi Meir says, and you have a man who, if a fly falls into his dish, squashes it and eats it up. This is the trait of a wicked man, who seeks who sees his wife go out with her head uncovered, spinning in the market and naked to the arms, and bathing with men. This is what our Beretta says, and it's Josefta 5.9, actually. This, the the Beretta is uh, actually illustrating what an indecent wife, an act of indecency on the part of a wife is. So this Beretta is actually being introduced by Rabbi Meir. Uh, this Beretta of Rabbi Meir's teaching is actually being introduced to elaborate essentially upon Rabbi Shammai's opinion, or the House of Shammai's opinion, I'm sorry, the House of Shammai's position, which is, by the way, our position, but it's the minority position, which, again, shows you how much uh, the, the, the Talmud goes in explaining and elaborating a minority position. Do you honestly mean bathing with men? <laughs> uh, or as my daughter would say, are you serious right now, Dad? <laughs> are you serious right now? Uh, you really mean, are you serious? Bathing with men? Seriously? In other words, that, that, there's no way. You can't, the, the Beretta can't be saying bathing with men. Are, are you kidding me? Rather, bathing in a place in which men bathe. In this case, it is a religious duty to divorce her in line with the verse because he has found some unseemingly thing in her and he sends her out of his house and she goes and becomes someone else's wife. Scripture calls him another, another man's wife. Why does Scripture say another man's wife? Why is it another man's wife? We're going to find out. He is not the match of the first. He's not like the first man. He's very fundamentally different from the man that sent her out of his house. This one has sent a wicked woman out of his house, but the other has brought a wicked woman into his house. If the second one has merit, he too will send her out. If he was any good, if he was any, and the latter husband hates her. But if not, she will bury him if the latter husband die. He is worthy of death, 
for this one has sent off a wicked woman from his house, and that one has brought a wicked woman into his house. Okay? Uh, so there, these are two totally different kinds of men. The man that took this woman in is a wicked man, or at least, well, yeah, because he takes a wicked woman into his house knowing it. He's totally, un, he's another man. He's a totally different man from the man that uh, would take her, send her out. For a hateful one puts away Malachi 2.16. Malachi 2.16, for a hateful one puts away. Now we're going to have, our Talmud is going to um, discuss the meaning of this verse. Rabbi Judah says, if you have hated her, put her away. In other words, this verse is saying, he's a hateful one who put her away because he hated her. She found no favor in his eyes, so he hated her, so he got rid of her. So if you hate your wife, you can divorce her, following Akiva, if you will, here. Rabbi Yochanan says, he who puts away his wife is, is hated. In other words, it's saying, no, 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 no. It's saying that he's hated because he put his wife away. So Rabbi Yochanan seems to be siding with Shema and with Yeshua, saying it's, you know, it's a hateful thing for a man to put away his wife. The Gemara then seeks to reconcile the position of these two sages. They do not differ. One speaks of the first marriage, the other the second, in line with what Rabbi Eliezer said. Rabbi Eliezer said, whoever divorces his wife, his first wife, even the altar sheds tears for what he has done, and his this further you do, you cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with sighing, inasmuch that he regards not the offering any more, neither receives it with goodwill at your hand. In other words, oh, he doesn't even like your offerings anymore. That's because he, as Yeshua says in Matthew 12, and quoting Hosea, I desire chesed, not sacrifice. I want you to be forgiving. Yet you say, why? Because the Lord has been witness between you and your wife, the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and the wife of your covenant. Malachi 2, 13 through 14. And that's interesting. Uh, Eliezer, of course, we've been talking about in the last two lessons. He appears to have been a Nazarene. And here we have him standing up for marriage, at least a first marriage. Okay. Um, now, I want to talk about, uh, now that we have an understanding of our Mishnah and our Gemara, in regards to our Mishnah, I want to introduce another voice, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and see what the Essenes and the Qumran community had to say about this subject, because they had some very interesting things to say. Um, reading from the manual, uh, the Damascus document, I believe, is that correct? Let me make sure I have that correct here. Yes, the Damascus document. Uh, it says, the shoddy wall builders who went after precept, this is uh, referring to the Pharisees who were wall builders, built a, says, build a wall around the Torah, precepts of Talmud, and the Essenes felt that their wall was shoddy, in other words, it was uh, 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 not strong enough. In other words, the, the Essenes were also in favor of a wall around Torah, but it, an even stricter one. Okay, which is what 4QMMT and, and, and so on is about. So they said, uh, um, uh, pre uh, Precept is a river of whom it says they shall surely rave, Micah 2.6. 
They are caught in two traps, fornication by taking two wives in their lifetime, although the principle of creation is male and female, he created them. Genesis 1.27. And those who went into the ark went in two by two, Genesis 7.9. And those who went, I'm um, sorry, concerning the leader, it is written, he shall not multiply wives to himself. Deuteronomy 17, 17. Okay, so it talks here about something called the principle of creation. In the Hebrew, it's the Yisod HaBriah, the principle of creation. It says, the, the Essenes said the Pharisees have fallen astray because they take two wives in their lifetime. It's talking about polygamy, but it's talking about polygamy through the back door of divorce. And it's saying since these divorces are invalid, because he divorces as well as if, if, if the Torah is being misinterpreted, you can't really divorce a wife because uh, you found a prettier girl, then you're still married to the first one when you marry the second. If you can't really marry, divorce a woman just because she burned your food, then you're still married to that one when you go off and marry another one. Okay, and so the, the, this is backdoor polygamy, and it violates the Yisod Habriah of two becoming one. Okay, and this is the, uh, so this is the position of the Essenes. They opposed the, uh, 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 the the divorce because they the Pharisee doctrines of divorce because they thought they were too loose and were backdoor polygamy. They violated the Yisod Habriah, the principle of creation. Now we're going to uh, well let's first look at Matthew five where Yeshua talks about divorce and then we'll go into more go where he talks in more detail about it in Matthew nineteen. Uh, in Matthew chapter five verse thirty one. It has been said concerning him that would put away his wife that he should write her a bill of divorcement and give it to her and send her away from his house. This is uh, in reference to our very Torah passage, Deuteronomy 24.1, which our, Gemara, our mission in Gemara were discussing. But I tell you that whoever shall put away his wife except for the cause of fornication commits adultery with her, and whoever takes her that is cast off commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to them of old time, you shall not forswear yourself, but shall pay to Yahweh your... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> should stop there at the end of 32. Okay, now let's turn to Matthew chapter 19. And here, Yeshua is going to give, in Matthew chapter 19, a Midrash. Following... Uh, some uh, very systematic rules of Midrash. It's a, a formulated according to what we call a Yel Medino Midrash. Lamed meaning learn, to learn. Yel Medino means, Medino means we have learned. Okay? It's a Yel Medino, uh, it's a homiletic Midrash. We have learned. And what it does is it uses key words to tie um, passages together according to one of Hillel's rules actually okay the, verse 3 chapter 19 verse 3 and the Pharisees approached him and tempted him saying is it right for a man to put away his wife for every cause for every cause anything in other words they're putting forth Hillel's position and he answered and he said to them have you not read that he made man in the beginning and made them male and female. Now, it's quoting the same passage, essentially the same passage, or very similar to the uh, passage that the uh, Essenes quoted, the Damascus document, and said, Wherefore shall a man cleave to his father and his mother, and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So, yeah, the first passage he quoted is actually the passage that the Damascus document quotes. Then he quotes a further passage, Genesis 2.24, talking about the two becoming one flesh. Then he expounds 
having quoted Genesis 127 and Genesis 224, and he gives the exposition. And now then they are no more two, but one flesh only. What therefore Elohim is joined together, man cannot separate. So man can't simply just separate what Elohim joined together. So we can't just write a bill of divorcement because I found a pretty error. In fact, this would lean towards Shammai's view that not only does it have to be a, a matter of um, uh, an unseemly matter, but um, a matter of indecency, that's the good word, the, a matter of indecency, not only must it be a matter of indecency, but in keeping with Deuteronomy 19, uh, 1915, I believe it is, there must be witnesses to the indecency. Uh, because then it's something that has to be done by the Beit Din, because Elohim joined them together. So it would a man couldn't just uh, write a bill of divorcement, he would have to have the Beit Din and present and make his case. Chapter 19, verse 7, But they said, And why then did Moshe then command to give a bill of divorcement and to put her away if she's not pleasing in his sight? So here they're quoting Akiva's view, well, they're not quoting Akiva's view because Akiva hadn't said it yet, but they're quoting the view that is that is espoused by Akiva that actually takes the more extreme view that if she's not pleasing in his sight, he can send her away. And Yeshua answers, verse 8, And he answered them and said, Because Moshe, on account of the hardness of your hearts, allowed you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. What is the beginning? Bereshit, the beginning. And remember, he quoted Genesis twice over. He's talking about the same thing the Qumran scroll, Damascus document, is talking about. The Yisod Habriah, he's saying it violates the principle of creation, the Yisod Habriah. Therefore, it was not so in the beginning. It wasn't this way in Bereshit. It wasn't this way in the beginning. It wasn't the foundation of creation. That's not the way the foundation of creation is. The Yisod Habriah. The foundation of creation is that they are created male and female, and that the two become one. And that Yahweh has joined them together. And it's not just for a man to, to uh, uh, supersede what he has done. And I tell you, every man that has put away his wife or shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. The word is zenot in the Hebrew. And takes another, commits adultery. And whoever takes the divorced also commits adultery. So he sides with Shammai and uh, with the Essene view on this particular matter in the Damascus document. And he says, no, it violates the Yesod Habriah. That's not the way it was intended. That's not what the foundation of creation was. Elohim has joined them together. Let no man separate them. It has to be a matter of zenot. It has to be a matter of indecency, essentially. He takes it further. It says a matter of zenot, for clarification, of what indecency means. And what is zenot? Well, that's another issue. What is zenot? Um, the wisdom of Ben Sirach says, in uh, 25, verses 25 through 26, allow no outlet to water and no boldness of speech in an evil wife. If she does not go as you direct, separate yourself from her. And the wording here in you know, the original actually refers back to Deuteronomy 24.1. So here it defines zenot, if you will, or uh, a matter of indecency is, is um, e uh, evil, uh, an evil wife who does not go as you direct. Therefore, there's boldness of speech. She doesn't do what you say to do. And I'm not saying, okay, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm saying she was rebellious against her husband. Okay. Um, can this be zenote? Or does it have to be an actual sexual immorality? Uh, there is a good case to be made that zenote can, can actually be interpreted that way. 
uh, in Leviticus 17, verse 7, and 20, verses 5 through 6. At Deuteronomy 31, 16, the words note is used to refer to an idolater. Now, one could say this is because one uh, cheats on Elohim, commits adultery from Elohim with a false deity, or it can also be understood that one is wandering away from Elohim. But Psalm 73, verse 27, definitely uses the phrase to refer, phrase the note to refer that one, the one that goes astray from Yahweh. So, a Zenote, a matter of Zenote could also be one who goes astray from, not only from Yahweh, but from her husband. In other words, she strays from her husband, she's disobedient to her husband, uh, she will not recognize his place as her husband. And that can also be Zenote, as I understand the wisdom of Ben Sarah. Okay, that of course is just uh, a tangent issue because that was not actually discussed in our Talmud passage today. Okay, so our Talmud tells us that there was debate between three schools of thought, uh, Hillel, uh, well, Shammai, and Messiah, Yeshua, unusually in this case. Uh, in, in this case, it takes the unusual position of siding with Shammai, because normally he sides with Hillel, but this time he sides with the house of Shammai, and the house of Shammai says that if a man divorces his wife, it must be because it is a matter of indecency. And Yeshua says that must be Zenot. And um, there's a case to be made that Zenot's more than just fornication, but it must be a matter of indecency. It must be a matter of Zenot. It can't simply be a thing. Now, Hillel says it can be a devar, a thing, anything. He can divorce his wife for anything. So if she burns his food, if she spoils his dish, or if she puts too much salt in it, or too much pepper, or whatever, he can divorce his wife for that. And, um, and, and he says that's because it says a thing, devour, anything. But Shammai, by the way, was so clear as to say that because that word devour is there, it actually means that he has to establish it to the Beit Deen with witnesses. And then Rabbi Akiva says, that the word key there should be understood to mean simply if, not because, and therefore that when it says he finds a prettier girl, I mean, I'm sorry, when it says she find no favor in his eyes, that doesn't have to mean that she find no favor in his eyes because of a matter of indecency. It could be she finds no favor in his eyes or there's a matter of indecency and therefore uh, therefore, it could mean that he simply found a prettier girl, or that for whatever reason, she doesn't have to do anything wrong. Uh, with Hillel, at least she had to do something wrong, but Akiva says, no, she really doesn't have to do anything wrong. He can divorce her for anything. And then, of course, as the, the, uh, the Talmud continues, it goes on to say, well, if, uh, if he was uh, following the directives of Torah, in doing the honorable thing and marrying a virgin that he spoiled, then he can't divorce her just because he found a prettier girl, but he can divorce her for a matter of indecency. And that's one of the distinction. There's a distinction um, uh, according to the Babylonian Talmud. Um, our, uh, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us that the Essenes sided with Shammai, if you will, and uh, were against Hillel and Akiva because they, they, they thought that this, the uh, position that you could just divorce your wife for anything was not only false, violated the Yisod Habriah and resulted in backdoor polygamy because since these divorces weren't valid, they were marrying these other women, they were still married to the old ones, and it violated the Yisod Habriah because they were married to more than one wife in their lifetime. And Yeshua also takes that position and quotes the same verse uh, from Genesis and says it was not so in the beginning, that's not the Yisod Abriah, uh, that uh, a man cannot simply divorce his wife for anything, but it must be a matter of zenot, which is um, uh, uh, wandering from away or being guilty. Okay, but it must be, you know, following 
the interpretation of a matter of indecency. Okay, and so uh, this is our uh, under our study of Yatim for today, and I hope that you have benefited from today's study of Mishnah and Gemara and the Talmud. Uh, this is a wonderful example of how understanding Talmud helps us understand the words of Yeshua, both in Matthew 5 and particularly in Matthew chapter 19, and also uh, um, uh, how studying the Talmud better and helps us better understand the position that Yeshua is advocating, because we learn uh, Shammai's arguments against Hillel. We learned that Shammai also took the position which Yeshua, what you would think, seems to agree with because it's the Shammai position that Yeshua is agreeing with, that when it says word there, it actually means that the uh, matter of indecency has to be established by witnesses to the Beit Din because the two were joined together by Elohim. So it actually takes a Beit Din act for him to make his case for divorce. He can't just write a bill of divorcement and send her on his way without uh, uh, making a case for it. Okay? And so this is uh, uh, the conclusion of our study for today. I hope you will join us in our next study in Talmud for Beginners. Shalom.